What should be the goals of a healthcare system? To answer that question, policymakers and healthcare administrators have come up with the triple aim, which is basically the three goals of a healthcare system that the healthcare policy community believes are what we should be aiming for whenever we evaluate the success or failure of a healthcare system. And this includes many different levels of healthcare systems, right up from the very top sort of healthcare policy at the national level, down to a system of doctor's offices or a system of hospitals that might be working together. If you're going to evaluate how good is this system doing at the goals of a healthcare system, these are the three things to focus on. And those three goals of the triple aim are improve population health, improve patient experience of care, and that includes both quality and satisfaction, and third, reduce the per capita cost of healthcare, which probably should be reducing the growth rate of the per capita cost of healthcare. That's just an economist's gripe. That would be the way I would improve that aim. But in this video, I'm gonna be going through these three goals and answering questions about why are these goals phrased that way. The specific questions I'm going to address are, why did we decide population health rather than individual health is the right way of thinking about that particular goal. And then for the second triple aim, why does patient experience or patient satisfaction, why does that need to be different from patient health? Why are those two separate goals in the triple aim? And third, if we're talking about per capita cost of healthcare, the question here is why should costs even matter? And I'll answer that one from an economist's perspective. Let's start with the first one, which is the goal of improving population health. And we wanna know why population health rather than individual health. And this has to do with the empirical nature of healthcare. We want the doctors and nurses and everyone involved to be making the best possible decision for the patient in expectation. So there's always going to be some uncertainty about how the patient responds to treatments. And so if we look at a case when a patient was prescribed a particular procedure to treat their illness and that patient dies or has a negative outcome, we have to ask the question, was the healthcare system doing something irresponsible? And we know that it's possible for doctors to make the best possible decisions for patients and patients to still die. Sometimes patients will die on the surgical table even if that surgery was the best thing possible for them. And sometimes patients who have received bad advice from the healthcare system could get better anyway because the immune system kind of does its work even if the doctor hasn't opted for the best possible treatment. So when we're evaluating, is a healthcare system doing a good job? We want to think in expectation. We want to look at the moment when the doctor is making the decision for the patient, and we want to be asking the question, is this the best decision? Rather than looking at the outcome, you know, the second goal in the triple aim is to improve patient experience of care. And this includes both quality and satisfaction. So the question here is why does this need to be different from the first goal? And there's a number of factors at play here. The first thing has to do with simply measurement. When we're looking at population health, we're really gonna measure that by observable outcomes. Did the patient die? Is the patient constantly in and out of the hospital? Is the patient's blood pressure under control? That's the first of the triple aim. The second really is, what do patients tell you when you ask them the quality of their care? And part of this is related to actual quality that cannot be measured in any way other than asking the patient. For example, pain. We don't really have a good measure of pain apart from the patient's self-reported experience. Also, patient self-reported health is actually really correlated with death rate. But patient experience of care is more than that. It also encompasses things like, is the patient's care plan well matched to the patient's values? Sometimes there's a trade-off between expected lifespan and quality of life in the sense of your ability to interact with family, your ability to function independently. There, there's a number of factors that can come into tension in healthcare, and we don't want to necessarily say that the right medical decision is always the life-extending one, especially for terminally ill patients. We want to make sure that their care plan is being weighed against the patient's goals for their life, which can be more complex than just extending life. 
There's also the issue of the limitations within the patient's life. It could be that the best health outcomes for this patient would come if they made these major overhauling changes to their life, where they're constantly measuring their blood sugar and they're going on very restrictive diets and they're refraining from many activities in their life that they consider meaningful and enjoyable. And it could be that the patient looks at that and says, you know what, I acknowledge that that regimen is going to give me the best health outcome, but for me, me, I'd rather have something a little scaled back. I'll change my diet a little bit, but not completely. It's really hard for me to constantly be going back and forth to the doctor, and I don't like the idea of that lifestyle. So a treatment plan that's a little bit less onerous might actually be better for some patients than the treatment plan that's recommended purely based on health outcomes. And by including patient experience of care in this measure, we capture that. We allow the system to deviate from the optimal plan in terms of health outcomes in order to better align it with the way the patient wants to live out their life. And finally, there's other things about the patient's experience of care that just matter a lot. This is things like respect from the doctor or respect from the hospital staff. It's things like communication. How clearly is the medical staff communicating expectations and needs and treatment plans to the patient? Those things matter a lot, but it's easiest captured in the patient experience of care since communication and respect are inherently self-reported by the patient. So this middle triple aim, patient experience of care, brings a lot to the table in terms of evaluating healthcare systems that's not necessarily captured in the population health element. Finally, we've got per capita cost of healthcare. And the biggest question about this one is why does it matter? One of the reasons here has to do with sustainability. We know that new medical technologies are constantly entering into the healthcare system. And the question is, can we continue to invent new technologies and work them into the system? Or are there going to be forces that, that kind of say we're at capacity in terms of what we can actually create in the healthcare system, so we really can't take on new innovative technologies? And if that's the case, then we're gonna stop improving the pace at which medical care gets better. And that's better in terms of quality. So here's how to think about that. And if you wanna think about money like an economist does, you think of money as a tool for organizing scarce resources. It is Money isn't valuable in and of itself. It's valuable as a tool to channel resources where they should go. In which case we have to ask ourselves, what are the scarce resources that we're talking about with the healthcare system? And clearly it's labor related resources. It's doctors, nurses, medical innovators, which includes chemists and scientists of all stripes. And let's imagine a new medical technology entering into the system. And let's say it does something really cool, like extends the lifespan of diabetic patients or slows the spread of cancer, something really cool. If that's going to enter into the system, it's going to take doctor's time to administer the technology, perhaps nurse time. It's going to take medical innovators who are sort of watching what are the consequences of this technology and how do we fix the little problems that go along to make the technology better. And if we're going to put that new technology into the system, that's going to increase costs, obviously. But it increases costs by increasing the amount of labor that goes into medical care. The problem here is that we can't just continue doing this forever and ever and ever. Right now in the US, about 18% of GDP goes toward healthcare. So back of the envelope calculations tell you that on average, one in five workers is working in the healthcare sector. If you insert a new technology that needs doctor's time and nurse's time into the system, you need more doctors and nurses to enter into the system. So that might take percent of GDP up from 18 to 19%. What we don't want to have happen is for every new medical technology to just bump up the percent of GDP devoted to healthcare because that means pulling workers away from other fields and other industries into the healthcare sector. And there's a limit to how much we can do that. Can we pull workers away from the entertainment industry? 
Yeah, probably. Can we pull some workers out of the restaurant industry? Yeah, probably. But we can't do this indefinitely. We need workers in other sectors. We need teachers, we need farmers, we need bus drivers. And essentially when the cost per patient goes up and up and up, that means we're pulling more and more of the workforce into healthcare. And eventually we're gonna reach the hard edges where we can no longer absorb new medical technologies because we have all of our workers sort of working at capacity. And what is that? Is that 50% of GDP? Is it 75% of GDP, 75% of workers in the healthcare industry? And the answer there depends how many workers do we need in other sectors like education and farming. So for this system to be sustainable, what we need to have happen is efficiency improvements in healthcare so that we can absorb new technologies without pulling too many workers out of other sectors. And really, we need this to happen at a sustainable rate. So we know that healthcare costs are going to rise over time. The question is, are they rising at a pace that's sustainable, that allows for adoption of new technologies, which means you might have to displace old technologies or do other things more efficiently to, to bring the new technologies into the system. So when I say per capita cost of healthcare, which is the official triple aim goal, I really add an asterisk to that as an economist and I say it's not the per capita cost of healthcare at a fixed point in time. This really is about containing the increase in per capita cost of healthcare so that the healthcare system is sustainable, so that it's flexible enough to bring in new technologies and improve the system without eating up too many resources from the rest of the economy. That's basically what we're doing here when we're thinking about per capita cost of healthcare. And in a lot of ways, this is about efficiency. It's about how much can the doctor get done? How much can the nurse get done in the time given to them? So if we hold their salary fixed and hold their number of hours worked fixed, then we have a sustainable, non-increasing per capita cost. But what we really want is for doctors to be more productive at addressing patient issues as new information and new technologies enter into the system. So it's really about this tension between new technologies entering into the system and trying to push costs up and productivity improvements putting downward pressure on per capita cost of healthcare, such that the rate of increase of prices in healthcare is sustainable. That's really what it is. There's the two forces. One pushes it up, which is medical innovation, and we like that. We want m as much medical innovation as possible. The downward pressure on per capita cost is the productivity improvements, and we just want to make sure that these two things are relatively in balance, because if there's too much upward pressure on per capita costs in healthcare without the downward pressure of productivity improvement, the healthcare sector is just gonna eat up more and more of the economy, and we want a thriving economy outside of the healthcare sector. So that's why this third triple aim is pretty important. Now, these are the official triple aim goals of the healthcare system, but I would like to add one more, and I think that is, the pace of technology improvement. We want improvements in the healthcare system over time so that population health improves over time, so that patient experience improves over time. And technology can take many different forms. It's not just machines, it's different organizational structures, different motivational structures for healthcare workers and motivational structures for patients, different types of conversations that could enter into the healthcare system between doctors and patients. All of that is new technology that can could improve the other three elements of the triple aim. So I really think innovation over time and improvements in the system should be a goal of the healthcare system, and then it should receive equal weight as the first three goals. But that's just my opinion as an economist. That is not officially part of the triple aim. In any case, I hope you found this video helpful in thinking through what are the goals of a healthcare system? Why do healthcare policymakers choose the three goals in the triple aim? And why is each of these goals so important?